everyone. It is so wonderful to see you all here in this space. I'm really excited about this evening and all of the learning and engagement that's going to happen. Um, and welcome officially to the hashtag votes for all the power to create a more perfect democracy. We are extremely happy that you decided to join us in this virtual space. And when we, when you saw this event, I mean, I, I'm assuming that you read the description and it must have certainly had intrigued you that um, this year marks the centennial of both the Ocoee massacre and women's suffrage in the U.S. Um, I'm certain that you were also interested in just learning how these two pivotal historical moments relate to the unique connections to gender and race. So we invite you in this space to not only listen, like Rachel mentioned earlier, but to also engage in the rich discussion uh, with all of the stories and the voices in this, in this room. Um, and most of all, we're just really grateful that you decided to be a part of us and be, to be a part of this learning opportunity. So thank you and welcome. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm happy to be here tonight. My name is Rachel Allen, and I am with the Peace and Justice Institute. Happy to be here with Jennifer Tomlinson, Dr. Heather Bryson, Gloria Picard, Dr. Ruth Edwards, and Dr. Kathleen Armstead. All of us are going to be partnering tonight to present um, Votes for All, uh, the power to create a more perfect democracy. And I want you to know that we are so fortunate to be here tonight from a, due to a generous grant from Florida Humanities, which is a part of the National Endowment of the Humanities, as well as all of our community partners that are listed here. And, and this work that you're going to see tonight, this learning, this conversation really grew up out of uh, meetings that took place between members of our community representing all these different organizations coming together to try to provide an opportunity for us to have a really honest conversation and an honest look at uh, our history here locally and nationally as we look at the 100-year memorial of the 19th Amendment and the Ocoee Massacre. Um, and so one of the threads that runs throughout tonight is voting and democracy and the critical nature of citizen engagement. So we are happy to invite Gloria Picar, who is with us tonight, uh, who is the president of the League of Women Voters Orange County, to talk to us about something we all know to be very important is voting. Thanks, Gloria, for being here. All right, so hi. I'm Gloria Picard, I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Orange County. Um, the League is a nonpartisan organization. We take positions on issues, but we don't take positions on political candidates running for office. But we do have a website that we make available every year, both nationally, statewide, and locally. It's called vote411.org. It's the League's own, so you can trust it for nonpartisan, factual, accurate election information. You can find information on this site on state and local amendments, as well as the candidates. By entering your address, you can see your exact ballot, then link out to questions and answers from the candidates. They key in their own information and provide a photo so you know it's the real deal. But first, everyone's gotta be registered. So if you're not registered or you know family or friends who are not registered, the deadline is October 5th for the very important November 3rd election. Here's a tip, and this is how I remember it every year. Registration closes 29 days before each election. You can register online in Florida. It takes about two minutes. Vote411.org will also lead you to voter registration in your county. Remember, you register by county and you vote by county. Vote by mail. The League supports vote by mail as safe, convenient, and efficient. We have an increase of 58% in Orange County in vote by mail for the primary, so we know vote by mail will be even more popular for the general election coming up November 3rd. With COVID-19, vote by mail is the safest and easiest way to be sure your vote counts. You gotta mail your, request your ballot every two years and, and request it um, 10 days before the election. The deadline for November 3rd is October 24th to get it mailed. We don't think that's soon enough, so we're encouraging people to mail it at least two weeks before the election. So as soon as you get your ballot, check out vote411.org, mark it, and sign it on the envelope and date it. It's best to use your driver license signature and then mail it. 
Most mail ballots that are rejected are because the person didn't sign it. No postage required in Orange and Osceola counties, but postage is expected in Seminole County. By hits, here's another little tip. The post office, by law, must deliver mail ballots, even if there are no stamps on the envelope. But you can also drop off your ballot in drive-by drop boxes at all early voting locations, October 19th and November 1, in your county. But in Florida, it must be received by election day, not postmarked, but received. Voting is safe, secure, and protected by law in Florida, and we have very good voter laws in Florida and a backup paper ballot for every vote. We're expecting a record, record turnout. So whatever way you choose to vote, please vote early. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gloria, for that really important information. And you'll see why um, the theme of voting is gonna be so important throughout the evening. Um, and to pivot into our discussion um, and our, our the first part of our program, um, we want to go over some important guiding principles because we are going to have that dialogue. We are going to have spaces where we share with each other. And so for us to have those conversations in the best way, we want to go over some guiding principles established by the Peace and Justice Institute. And some of you might be familiar with these. And for those that aren't, these are called the principles for how we treat each other. And we're going to review these together in this space right now to help us set an understanding of how we will engage with each other tonight in our small groups. So I'm going to go look through the gallery view and find some familiar faces and ask them if they don't mind to read each of the principles. If you, um, you know, feel compelled or um, are interested in reading one, if you don't mind volunteering, you can certainly post it in the chat. I'll see your name and I would really appreciate appreciate that as well. So I'm going to read the first one. Uh, the first one says, create a hospitable and accountable community. Let me move this over. We all arrive in isolation and need the generosity of friendly welcomes. Bring all of yourself to the work in this community. Welcome others to this place and this work and presume that you are welcomed as well. Hospitality is the essence of restoring community. I see that we have a volunteer for the second one, Samina. Yes. Thank you. Uh, this is Samina Beg. Uh, listen deeply. Listen intently to what is said. Listen to the feelings beneath the words. Strive to achieve a balance between listening and reflecting, speaking and acting. Thank you. I see Stacy Jones has also volunteered. Okay, it says create an advice-free zone. Replace advice with curiosity as we work together for peace and justice. Each of us is here to discover our own truths. We are not here to set someone else straight to fix what we perceive as broken in another member of the group. Thank you. Amaris has volunteered for the fourth. Practice asking honest and open questions. A great question is ambiguous, personal, and provokes anxiety. Thank you. Um, I see Liana in the gallery. Do you mind reading one? No, and hello. Five give space for unpopular answers. Answer questions honestly, even if the answer seems unpopular. Be present to listen, not debate, correct, or interpret. Thank you. We have another volunteer, WRF4F5. Respect silence. Silence is a rare gift in our busy world. After someone has spoken, Take time to reflect without immediately filling the space with words. This applies, no, I can't read that other word. This applies to the speaker as to well. To speaker, be comfortable leaving your words to resound the silence without refining or elaborating on what you have said. Thank you. Thank you. I see Hank in our gallery. Would you mind reading the next one, number seven? 
How about we try Crystal? Do you mind while Hank works on his audio? Sure. Number seven, suspend judgment. <clears throat> Set aside your judgments. By creating a space between judgments and reactions, we can listen to the other and to ourselves more fully. Thank you. Julie said she can read number eight. Thank you for volunteering. Identify assumptions. Our assumptions are usually invisible to us, yet they undergird our worldview. By identifying our assumptions, we can then set them aside and open our viewpoints to greater possibilities. Thank you. Sorry about that. Our number nine, um, speak your truth. You're invited to say what is in your heart, trusting that your voice will be heard and your contribution respected. Own your truth by remembering to speak only for yourself. Using the first person I rather than you or everyone clearly communicates the personal nature of your expression. Thank you. 10. When things get difficult, turn to wander. If you find yourself disagreeing with another, become judgmental or shutting down in defense, try turning to wander. I wonder that brought her to this place. I wonder what my reaction teaches me. I wonder what he's feeling right now. Thank you. Dr. Bryson, do you mind reading one for us too? Of course. Practice slowing down. Simply the speed of modern life can cause violent damage to the soul. By intentionally practicing slowing down, we strengthen our ability to extend nonviolence to others and to ourselves. Thank you. Dr. Armstead, do you mind reading number 12 for us? In number 12, all voices have value. Hold the, these moments when a person speaks as precious because these are the moments when a person is willing to stand for something, trust the group, and offer something they see as valuable. Thank you. And I'm going to invite Rachel to read the last one if she doesn't mind. Maintain confidentiality. Create a safe space by respecting the confidential nature and content of discussions held in the group. Allow what is said in the group to remain there. And I want to um, appreciate everybody for reading the principles. Thank you, um, Jennifer. And, and just to talk about how we're going to, um, you know, spend our time together tonight. Uh, before some of you all got here, we talked about that tonight really is an engaged um, experience. So some of you all, I'm seeing you from Peace Week. Good to see you. <laughs> um, and so you kind of have an idea of how this goes, right? We're going to talk to each other. And so if you can, please pr be prepared. And if you can do it now to just put your video on, if that's possible. Now, I know some of y'all are eating your dinner and you're getting ready to be present here. But we are going to ask that people have on their video, especially when we go into the small groups, because we're going to have a conversation with each other. And it's just so much nicer to be in conversation um, when we can look at each other and be together. Because fundamentally, our work is about building community among each other, right? So that we can live together in peace and, and with justice. So I want to just let you know, we're going to break out into small groups multiple times. And we are recording tonight. These small groups are not recorded. I want to be clear about that. When you're in the small group, having your conversation, sharing stories, it's not recorded. And so here's the thing. The invitation is to tell your story, to tell the truth, as, as comfortable as you can feel to talk about your lived experience. Because what we know is that we can tell y'all all the history and all these stories that are in the textbooks, and yet the textbook of our lives, the stories of our lives are really what have changed me in this work of growing toward peace and justice. It's your stories that have changed me. So we will maintain the confidentiality uh, of principle number 13. And, um, and we will acknowledge the risk that it is for many of us to talk about ourselves and to tell our story. So we honor you and we thank you 
for being willing to do that. So we're going to start though with what we call, you know, the scholarship on the shelf before we get into uh, telling our own stories. And that is looking at this history um, that we want to talk about. So we are very fortunate to have Dr. Heather Brayson and Elizabeth um, Thompson here tonight um, to share this history with us. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Elizabeth. I guess it helps to come off mute. Thank you, uh, Rachel. And thank you everyone for joining us. What we want to explore in the next 20 minutes with everyone is the tension between the promise and the reality of democracy in the United States. In 1776, when Thomas Jefferson wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain and alienable rights. What we know now is that when he said all men, he didn't really mean all men, certainly not the men who were enslaved and not women. In fact, when the US Constitution was ratified in 1788, depending on what state you lived in, you couldn't access the ballot if you did not own property, if you were uh, a white woman, if you were a free black man or a free black woman, if you were Jewish and you certainly couldn't vote if you were enslaved. These revolutionary and optimistic documents encased the majority of Americans in a state of political powerlessness. Those out of the democracy were people deeply affected by the laws of the land, but were without a voice in how to shape those laws. This nation then was born pregnant with rebellion, a rebellion of those who believed in the promise of democracy, but could not yet partake in its most fundamental deed, that of voting. One of the most enduring and significant rebellions to expand the right to vote was the women's suffrage movement. The suffrage movement, born from the abolition movement, which was the fight to end slavery, was organized in 1848 and spanned three generations of women until the 19th Amendment was passed in 1920. The fight for women's suffrage, which was the largest expansion of the franchise in American history, is a testament to the undeniable power and strength of women who came before. Women who represented diverse voices across America took part in this movement. Women like Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, an African-American abolitionist, a conductor on the Underground Railroad, a co-founder of the National Association of Colored Women, and a poet and writer who addressed vital issues of the 19th century in her work. Women like Sojourner Truth, an abolitionist and suffragist who highlighted the intersections of oppression she endured as a Black woman living in the United States. Susan B. Anthony, who devoted her childhood to ending slavery and her adulthood to obtaining the ballot for women. In 1872, Susan B. Anthony was arrested for attempting to vote. She fought to vote, claiming it was her right to do so under the 14th Amendment, which guaranteed the rights and protections of, all, of the Constitution to all citizens. Ida B. Wells, a journalist who fought against lynching, who wrote on the connections between Black economic power and white violence. Wells was a founder of the NAACP, and she was a devoted suffragist, maintaining that all women had the right to vote. Alice Paul, who planned the 1913 women's suffrage procession in Washington, DC. Paul organized silent protests in front of the White House and was arrested and incarcerated for these protests. When she claimed to be a political prisoner and went on a hunger strike, her jailers force fed her. Sorry, the protest uh, in front of the White House in 1917 that have become one of the most famous photographs of the suffrage movement. 
These were silent protests. For over two years, these women, referred to as the silent sentinels, stood in front of President Woodrow Wilson's White House. Uh, and their goal was to make it impossible for the president to enter or leave the White House without encountering a sentinel bearing some device pleading the suffrage cause. In, 19, in November 1917, after months of silently picketing, 33 of these women were arrested uh, and sent to Algonquin Workhouse in Virginia. On the night of November 14, 1917, the suffragists endured what is now referred to as the Night of Terror, during which they were detained, beaten, kicked, choked, stripped naked, chained to the bars in their cell, and stabbed with sticks that once carried their own protest banners. And they were force fed until they became ill. These women and thousands of women like them fought for the right to participate in the American experiment. In fact, suffragists were some of the first Americans to stage nonviolent protests in front of the White House. They were some of the first to go on hunger strikes and some of the first to stage a massive parade in Washington, D.C. in an effort to popularize their cause. Women across three generations were willing to sacrifice their freedom and their lives to gain the right to vote for themselves and their daughters. Here are just a couple of images of parades and protests around the nation between 1913 and 1919. The struggle for suffrage was met with an enormous amount of resistance throughout the country. From the White House to state and local legislatures, newspapers and clubs that formed to keep women from the ballot. They were harassed, arrested, beaten, and tortured. This effort to restrict women from the ballot box was really just the tip of the iceberg when it came to the conflict over the right to vote. Ever since the passage of the 15th Amendment in 1870, which granted universal male suffrage and effectively gave African-American men the right to vote, a complex bureaucracy which insisted that voting was a privilege, not a right, sprung up around the ballot. You had to pay a poll tax. You had to pass a literacy test. You had to prove that your grandfather could vote. You had to have a white man certify your registration. You had to correctly guess how many jelly beans were in a jar. Each of these new and varied requirements were passed to suppress the black vote. Additionally, an organized campaign of terror was launched to intimidate black men from casting a ballot. The Ku Klux Klan is the most famous terrorist group who killed and maimed to control the outcome of elections but the Klan is not the only group in our history that has insisted that certain Americans do not have inalienable rights in this democracy. This conversation, who deserves the rights of citizenship, which is at its core about the right to vote, began with the Declaration of Independence in 1776, and it continues today. The racism that animated the Klan and white American society in general in the 19th and early 20th centuries was mirrored in the women's suffrage movement. In a particularly heroic moment, suffragist and anti-lynching anti crusader Ida B. Wells refused to march in the back of the Illinois delegation in the 1913 suffrage parade. She was joined by 22 other African-American women all of whom were founding members of the African-American sorority Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated. The request of white suffragists to put Wells in the back of the dele delegation was emblematic of a larger problem in this movement. That women, time and time again, either refused to let black women be members of local suffrage organizations or refused to take up the causes that were important to black suffragists lynching, white on black sexual violence, and the social and political and economic effects of Jim Crow. In the face of endemic racism and sexism, 
Black women organized a club movement across the U.S. in 1895 under the banner organization of the National Association of Colored Women, which became an integral part of the rich tradition of organizing efforts of Black women. The NACW became the largest federation of Black women's clubs in America and remained committed to women's suffrage until the passage of the 19th Amendment. Because Black women refused to be silenced on account of their race or their gender, because so many women in this country persisted in their insistence to be full citizens in our democracy, because they marched, protested, went on hunger strikes, faced arrests, and endured torture, because our mothers, our grandmothers, and great-grandmothers truly believed in the promise of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote, was finally ratified on August 18, 1920. The first election in which all women could participate was the election on November 2nd of 1920. The election of 1920 came on the heels of a divisive chapter in American history, followed the conclusion of World War II a war that highlighted anxieties over the social order on the home front. Many whites feared the new power of returning black veterans. Men were concerned about the expansion of women's roles during the war and new waves of immigration prompted anxiety and often violence toward those deemed to be un-American, whether this label was derived because of one's politics, heritage, or religion. The summer of 1919, which is often referred to as Red Summer, saw many of these tensions play out in a nation bitterly cleaved by race, gender, religion, ethnicity, and one that had been ravaged by the 1918 flu pandemic. Racial violence took place across the United States in the summer of 1919 in 25 cities and towns, including Elaine, Arkansas, Bisbee, Arizona, Chicago and Washington, D.C. Much like the election of 2020, the election of 1920 came in the wake of a devastating and divisive year, and it marked an important moment in American history, as it was the first election in which American women across the nation could practice democracy. November 2nd, 1920 was a day when one version of America was becoming another version one that was closer to the promise of a real democracy. These large leaves forward in our history, the end of slavery, the passage of the 15th Amendment, the passage of the 19th Amendment, they are never without a backlash, and that backlash was nowhere clearer than here in Central Florida. In the months leading up to the election of 1920, African Americans in Florida launched what was referred to as the Florida Movement, an organized campaign to encourage African-American citizens to register and vote. Registration drives took place across the state. In response to the surge in Black voters in Florida, activists were fired, beaten, and assassinated. The weekend before the election of 1920, an estimated 500 Klan members and their supporters marched down Orange Avenue in an attempt to intimidate African-Americans and keep them away from the ballot. On November 2nd, 1920, the first day that uh, American women could exercise their right to vote on a national scale, white men in Orange County lynched July Perry and set fire to homes occupied by black residents in the town of Ocoee, Florida. An unknown number of men, women, and children, and forcing the rest of the African-American population to leave Okoe in those following months. The massacre began because July Perry and Mose Norman, wealthy African-American landowners, attempted to cast a vote. The death toll was not confined to Okoe, however. Black men were also killed in Gaston, Manatee, and Liberty counties on that election day. The violence was rooted in white anxiety over access to the ballot. 
It also stemmed from white resentment on the growing prosperity of black men. Additionally, the violence we submit was rooted in an overall anxiety that one America, a country controlled by white Protestant men, was becoming another America, one in which black men could wield economic and political power, a nation in which all women could vote, and one that was more ethnic, ethnically and religiously diverse as over 14 million men and women and children immigrated to America just before, during, or in the wake of World War I. One of the most popular planks of the 1920s Klan was an appeal to nativism, the argument that only certain kinds of people, Protestant Anglo-Saxons, had the right to claim citizenship in the US. This argument appealed to many white Americans who were fearful of a more diverse and democratic nation. The violence did not stop with the election, however. The following year, in 1921, the African-American business section of Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Greenwood District, was destroyed and hundreds of Black residents were murdered. In 1922, in the town of Perry, Florida, Charles Wright was lynched and a mob of whites burned a Black lodge, church, Black-owned businesses, homes, and a school. And in 1923, the self-sufficient African-American town of Rosewood, Florida was destroyed by a mob of white men and at least six African-Americans were killed, although some estimates range up to 150. The violence began because a white woman, Fanny Taylor, who's the elderly woman in the black and white picture on the upper right of your screen, um, accused a black man of assault. A posse of white men gathered and soon destroyed every house in Rosewood except for the only home owned by a white family. Black men and women were killed in the massacre and some reports include the death of children as well. And if we're here to tell the truth to one another about our history and use these truths as a way forward to create a more honest and more inclusive democracy, I want to use this opportunity very quickly to dip into my own family history. I would be remiss if I delivered a lecture on Rosewood and didn't mention that Fanny Taylor was a member of my grandfather's family. And she's the woman who started the massacre. And I grew up hearing this story um, time and time again as part of my own family history. And I really never knew what to make of it. And so when I went to school to study history, I was obviously interested or, or I was interested in white supremacy and how it works and um, why it's so appealing. And so I've studied Birmingham and white supremacy in Atlanta and Okoe and even in Germany and in South Africa, but I haven't yet forced myself to study honestly deep into the history of Rosewood. And I've been struggling with that a lot over the past couple of months. And after the last event, one of our panelists this evening, Dr. Ruth Edwards sent me an email and said, we need to talk about Rosewood. And so that correspondence has really emboldened me and I'm going to, I'm, I'm almost ready to really look into my family history of Rosewood. And I just wanted to mention that because if it's difficult for me to look into this, I can't imagine how difficult it is for the descendants of the victims of not only Rosewood, but other racial murders and massacres to look into their own family history across the 20th century and even before in this country. And so thank you for indulging me. I wanted to share that with you all. I wanted to be honest with you all. However, the backlash in Ocoee, in Perry, and in Rosewood, and across the state are really just the monstrous echoes of what we are here to discuss. We are here to highlight the work and the lives of those who believed in the promise of the United States, believed in the power of the ballot, and those who are still willing to fight for it. We're here to talk about the women who took it upon themselves to bring this nation closer to its true potential as a democracy, 
of the people and of all people, truly all people. One of the most important participants in the Florida movement was Mary McLeod Bethune. Uh, Mary McLeod Bethune was the founder of Daytona Normal and institutional Insti Industrial Institute for Negro Girls. In the months leading up to the 1920 election, Bethune rode her bicycle door to door to collect money to help others pay their poll tax, notably telling friends and residents to eat your bread, but eat it without butter so you can pay the poll tax. In the evenings, she hosted classes to teach others how to navigate the voting process. The Klan targeted Bethune and threatened to burn down her all-female school in response. Because of that, she held an all-night vigil to protect her students and her school. In the first election of 1920, Mary McLeod Bethune marched over 100 African Americans to the polls so that they could all safely cast their ballot. This is a story of persistence of women then and now who were working and are working to get us closer to the promise of America. It's the story of early mornings, long days, marching, protesting, raising money for others, writing letters, crisscrossing towns and cities to register people to vote, and long nights of tending to the rest of our lives. Uh, tending to your family, tending to your community, tending to your job. In this fight, the story of persistence, which was christened in 1848, did not end in 1920. The fight continued in the work of Mabel Ping Wali, who fought for the right to vote for Chinese Americans who had been restricted from the ballot since the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. The struggle continued in the efforts of Zitakala Sa. Uh, and Suzette LaFleche Tibble, who fought for Native American rights, including the right to vote um, as Native Americans were still without that right in 19. Because of their work and the work of others, the Indian Citizenship Act was passed in 1924, allowing many Native Americans the right to vote, although some states still continue to prohibit Native Americans from casting a ballot until the 1960s. Chinese Americans and Native Americans were not the only group of Americans still fighting for the right to vote after the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. The tactics to keep African Americans from the ballot continued long after women gained the right to vote. The bureaucratic measures, poll tax, literacy requirements, and understanding clauses continue to suppress the Black vote long after the 19th Amendment. In the summer of 1964, young men and women across the nation joined a local voter registration drive in Mississippi in an attempt to register as many African Americans as possible. Two women, Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker, helped to orchestrate this project in the Deep South. During the summer of 1964, known as Freedom Summer, summer 15,000 African Americans registered, yet only 1,200 were allowed to actually cast a ballot. This drive and the violent response to it highlighted the deep injustices in the South and contributed to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which prohibited literacy tests and mandated federal oversight of elections in certain areas although some of that federal oversight was rolled back in 2013. So the fight really does continue in our own time. Hamer, in her reflections on the progress of civil rights, admonished others to, quote, never forget from whence we came and always praise the bridges that carried us over. We, of course, could not say it any better. Our bridges are Mary McLeod Bethune, Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, and so, so many others. These are the women who believed in this country, who risked their lives to ensure that we all, whether we agree or not, that we all have a right to vote. They believed in the power of democracy and that this democracy, our democracy, is worth the fight. Thank you.
And Alicia, thank you. Thank you so much, Heather and Elizabeth. I would just like to invite everybody to just take a moment. Um, we're going to take a few deep breaths together and just allow ourselves to feel whatever it is we're feeling in our bodies and allow the thoughts to be there to begin to process this history that some people may be hearing for the first time. So if you wanna just dim your eyes and close them, but let's take a deep breath in. And let it out. Breathing in. And out. Last one, breathing in and out. Thank you, Elizabeth and, and Heather, for delivering that important history to us. And we want to give ourselves time to talk about this history and process it um, with whatever you're thinking and, and feeling. And we're going to do this in such a way that gives all of us the chance to speak and be heard. It's a process that we use called serial testimony. And this process is rooted in democracy. The woman who um, invented this process, Peggy McIntosh, said it was an autocratic administration of time in service of the democratic distribution of time. So the autocrat is this timepiece here, which is for me, my, my clock. And everybody's going to get a minute, one minute to share our story. And we'll listen to each person in our small group. We'll go around twice where each person in the group gets to tell their story. And then we'll have time to have a, a conversation, what we call crosstalk. And that's where we can kind of fill in some of those gaps and say, tell us more. You got cut off. The, the autocrat cut you off. Um, we want to hear the rest of the story. And so we can, we can do that. And then as we are in our stories, we, we practice these principles, not giving advice, not counseling and fixing one another, but rather just turning to wonder, listening deeply, and maybe asking an open, honest question. Can you tell us more? What did that feel like? How did your family respond? And that kind of question. So we are going to demonstrate this. Um, Jennifer and Crystal has offered um, to, to volunteer um, and just kind of show you how this works. And this is also a way of introducing you to the prompts that we're going to talk about. So the first prompt that we're going to talk about tonight is what are you feeling after hearing this history? And I'm going to share on this prompt and I'm going to set the timer here for one minute. And when you go into your small group, you're going to have somebody there um, supporting your group and just helping with the timer and just helping to make sure that we stay with the principles. Um, so here we go. One minute. What are you feeling after hearing this history? Um, I, I'm feeling a mixture of emotions because um, I hear a lot of this history echoed today. So I feel, I was thinking during the lecture, it's a hundred years later and we're, we're grappling with some of these same issues and some of these same struggles. And so I felt frustrated and, um, and, and worried, frankly, and then when I hear Heather be so honest about her family's history, and frankly, Heather, your own struggle to, to dive into it on a deeper level, and then the story of Dr. Edwards emailing you and saying, we're gonna talk about Rosewood, I feel, I just feel touched. I feel emotional because I think this is the power of this work, that it's helping each of us to go deeper, to face our history, to face our lives, so that we can 
strengthen our democracy. That was my one minute. Now, did you notice how I kind of held it up here so you all could see it and the timer can do that? Or um, if the person doesn't hear the timer go off, you just kind of let them know because sometimes they won't hear it. All right, so here, so everyone's gonna respond to that prompt, okay? What are you feeling after hearing this? And then, and these prompts are gonna go in the chat. So you're gonna have them in the chat and you'll be able to access them in your small group. And then the second round, uh, everyone's gonna choose one of these two. What were you taught to believe about voting from your family and your community growing up? And the second prompt is tell a story when you have witnessed or personally encountered voter suppression in your years of voting. And so Crystal is going to um, answer this first question. Crystal, your minute starts now. Thank you. So uh, when I was a kid, my sisters and I always went with our mom to vote and we always got a sticker, but that was kind of the extent of it. We didn't talk about it too much growing up. So it was really from the community and through PJI and the League of Women Voters where I started to learn more about the importance of voting and why I should vote. And um, I became a League member in 2013 and seeing the women especially in it just was so inspiring. And I I just feel like I can't ever miss an election and I, and I just feel like I'm doing my civic duty. I feel so powerful when I'm voting and in a good way. And um, I'll never forget the first time I was able to vote. And in that feeling, I just felt like I was a part of the community. And I feel like I'm standing up for what is right. I'm voting my voice and my future and a better future for everyone. <clears throat> okay, that was Crystal's one minute. Now, just to remind her, everybody, if somebody finishes early, and they don't fill their minute, we just hold that time for them. It's their one minute. We don't have to rush them. We can just hold that space and allow people to, um, to think further. They might tell us more, or we could just be together in silence. So now the final prompt, tell a story when you've witnessed or personally encountered voter suppression in your years of voting. And now Jennifer's gonna answer this one. Jennifer, your minute starts now. So I turned 18 on an election year and it was always stressed in my house. Like it was celebrated every time I was uh, to every election year. And so it was really exciting for me and my mother and my father. I was actually leaving Valencia. Uh, we all went together to go vote. And um, in my area, my neighborhood, the lines were just super long. Like people had been waiting hours and hours and hours to cast their ballot. And at the time, because I'm 18 and it, you know, it was such a big deal to finally get to vote. I just thought it was like, wow, so many people just really want to vote this year. Um, and so it wasn't until I got older that I realized um, that it wasn't so much that it was just an, an enormous year for voting, um, but that in my in my areas there weren't enough polling um, um, air, uh, polling stations, and so it impacted the lines. <laughs> um, and I live in the west side of Orlando. I grew up in Pine Hills, so um, it's interesting that I, I didn't even know that that was a form of of, of suppression until I was older. And, and, and whenever that happens, everybody, you can finish your sentence and kind of let people finish. And then, um, and then we will, um, and then we have a period that is called crosstalk. And this is where we can just have a conversation about what we've heard um, and um, ask questions, ask open and honest questions. So I'm putting us now into rooms. Um, so everyone's going to be in a room with about um, four to five people. When you get into your room, um, you're going to want to go ahead and just say each other's names. There is going to be somebody in the room that's familiar with the principles that can help guide that circle for you. Um, and they'll help guide the process. Um, are there any questions before we go out into our rooms here? 
You're not going to be rushed. You're going to have about 20 minutes. And again, this is the time when I want to encourage everybody to turn on those video cameras and unmute yourself and, and share with one another. Okay. Um, if you have any questions, you can send notes back to me. And also, um, you can always pop back into this room where I am if you have to, if you have to do that. Okay. See you back in 20 minutes. All right. Welcome back, everybody, from your small groups. Everybody's finding their way back. Here they come. Uh, Jennifer, I will turn it over to you. All right. I'm still kind of vibing off of my rich discussion. <laughs> so we have had a wonderful opportunity to learn a very full history, right? The whole history about voting in our direct lecture from Dr. Um, Heather Bryson and from Elizabeth Thompson. And we've had the opportunity to learn from each other by just exchanging thoughts and, and our stories. Um, and now we have an opportunity to learn from our scholarly experts. We actually have a panel and we're gonna do a Q&A session right now. So um, at this point, I, at this time, I'm going to introduce our two panelists. Some of you had them in your small groups, and I'm going to ask two questions, but you can also participate. So after they answer the questions I have prepared for them, you can also post in the chat a question that I could facilitate to them as well. All right. So joining us tonight is Dr. Patricia Broussard. She is a professor of law at, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> wrong column, I'm so sorry. Dr. Armstead, and she was in my group, so I was way off. Dr. Armstead is a sociology professor at Miami-Dade College, um, and she's been such a great community partner with us in this uh, project. She's published a number of articles. Um, among them is an, an article entitled Competing Narratives Fragmented Community, Stories of the Okoye Massacre of 1920. We also have with us Dr. Ruth Edwards, who's another great community partner and colleague. She is a director of education at the Winter Park Public Library, and she's the author of two books, um, Becoming a Black Woman, A Theory of Internalized Collection, Collective Consciousness, and another book entitled Step Into Yourself, Spiritual Affirmations for Embracing Change. Welcome, Dr. Edwards. Welcome, Dr. Armstead. Um, I'm going to direct the first question to Dr. Edwards. So, um, Black women have fought for freedom and for real democracy in the U.S. for generations. Uh, in what ways have they led this struggle, and why do you think so many of their contributions are left out of the large narrative of American history? Um, thank you for that. I'm going to rely on my crib notes because it's a lot. Um, in terms of the struggle for freedom and real democracy, it's taken place in multiple forms. Yes. And so multiple forums. So you could say that everything that Black women do is about freedom and democracy. Um, if you think about women like Anna Julia Cooper and Maya Angelou and Josephine Baker, um, a couple of them were performers. One was a scholar, but um, I think we're all called we're called to think of all of them as activists. And at the core of Black women's psychological DNA is resistance. Um, in her uh, text, Black Feminist Thought, Patricia Hill Collins points out that um, historically Black women's resistance to racial and class oppression could not have occurred without accompanying struggle for group survival. And I want you to hold on to that term, group survival. And so if we look at that in terms of Black women's resistance, there are two dimensions of activism that um, demonstrate survivalist behavior. One is actions taken to create Black female influence within existing social structures, and the other is struggles for institutional transformation, efforts to change discriminatory policies and procedures within institutions that uphold oppression. So let's look at these separately. 
black to the effort to create black female influence within existing social structures. Uh, the suffragists movement is a perfect example of that. According to Michelle Duster, a historian, there was a concerted effort by white women suffragists to create boundaries towards black women in the movement. Their efforts focused on achieving the same power as their husbands. Black women saw as vote the vote as a means to improving their condition and the state of their communities. So for black women, it's always anchored in action and um, activism is always rooted in how does this improve the community? How does this improve my family? How does this improve the place where I am and where we want to go? The other entity is efforts to change discriminatory policies and procedures within institutions. It's best demonstrated by the efforts of women involved in the civil rights movement. And this is as far back as Charlotte Fortin, who was an abolitionist who co-founded the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society and a member of the American Equal Rights Association, working towards women's suffrage and the, women and the right to vote simultaneously. And I always say, you know, for Black women, it is as difficult to separate Okay, wait a minute, I just moved my thing. It is as difficult to separate ourselves from the race and gender struggle as it is to step out of our skin color because we can't not be both of those things at the same time. Can't not be black and I can't not be female uh, simultaneously. So having, um, having entered a room, uh, there's no way for me to dissect a microaggression that comes at me and determine, is it coming at me because I'm a woman or is it coming back at me because I'm black? Because I'm always in that dual place of living and existing. The struggle for freedom and democracy is forever linked to the DNA of black women born and raised in the United States. And it has been ever since we arrived on these shores. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who was referenced in the presentation holds the distinction of being one of the few African-American women who was present at conferences and meetings between 1854 and 1890, where both of these issues were discussed. Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin was a pre-Civil War abolitionist who joined the Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Association. Ella Baker was a civil rights activist and freedom fighter who played a key role in establishing the NAACP SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, that all, and she also helped to establish Freedom Summer. All of these in an effort to focus attention on the racism and uh, activities coming at women or people in Mississippi to prevent them from voting. The other question you ask is what about where I are Black women's struggles left out of? Uh, U.S. history, and this was an interesting piece. There are people of African, Asian, Indigenous Indian, Mexican, Puerto Rican, East European, and South American descent excluded from U.S. history books. Many of them made important contributions to our country's development, and a significant number of them are women. I reflected back, I recalled actually a memory I had when I saw William Bennett, who was a former Secretary of Education in the Reagan administration, I saw him interviewed one time and the interviewer asked him, what do you think is the importance of multicultural education? And he said on national TV, I don't think there's any significance to it. The only thing we need to know is Western education. So that says a lot right there in terms of what we intentionally are, what intentionally was excluded from our education system and left out. The other piece, um, and having gone through that same education system, I can see why he would think that. The other thing that I want to call your attention to is a book that I cited last time and I'll cite it again. It's called The Deculturalization and the Deculturalization and the Struggle for Equality. And this is written by Professor Joel Spring of the New School University. And he gives us this notion of deculturalization, which really speaks to um, pushing down any differences between people from other groups who came to this country and who went into the classroom. 
and also creating this assimilist um, action toward education and creating this homogenous society. Deculturalization is the educational process of destroying people's culture and replacing it with a new culture. In the United States, schools have sued varying forms of this method in attempts to eradicate the cultures of Native American, African American, Mexican American, Puerto Ricans, and immigrants from Ireland, Southern and Eastern Europe, and Asia. Believing that Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-American culture was a superior culture and the only culture that would support Republican and Democratic institutions, educators forbade the speaking of non-English languages and forced students to learn an Anglo-American-centered curriculum. So we could interpret this to mean that the history books would only contain information that aligned with the dominant culture's desired picture of history. Several points to consider. Founding fathers rejected the idea of a multicultural society and advocated the creation of a unified American culture, unified under the definition of Anglo-American culture. Noah Webster, who created the dictionary, is often called the schoolmaster of America. His combined efforts to create the dominant culture and build nationalism by way of his legacy, a standardized American dictionary of the English language, an American version of the Bible and his spelling book. These three things were like the cornerstone of American education in the beginning. And finally, white European culture positioned women differently than African and Native American cultures, where both the latter societies functioned in a clan formation where women had an equal voice. Anglo-Americans operated from a nuclear family structure that gave power to the father and only the father. And so when we ask about why black women's accomplishments are not included in the history books, it's because the history books were established to only focus on one aspect of US culture. And that um, focus has continued and maintained over these hundreds of years. So that is what I offer. And thank you for the opportunity to answer those two questions. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Um, and like I said, if you have questions, um, please post it in the chat. And um, my next question is for Dr. Armstead. Uh, the history of anti-Black violence at the turn of the century was clearly linked to growing economic power and, and increasing demands for political representation among African Americans. The civil rights movement was not simply about ending segregation, but was also about economic and political equality, which resulted in both the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. A hundred years after the massacre of Okoe, what have we learned about voter repression? Thank you. Um, Jennifer, and um, thank you, Dr. Edwards. That's always beautiful to hear you speak. What I'd like to do is talk about voter repression, and I'd like to piggyback a little bit on um, what Dr. Edwards was saying. Um, African American, and especially African American women's history, has been deliberately left out. And one of the ways um, that this happened was Black women's right to vote was very clearly um, a danger to uh, white men. And nowhere is this more clear than uh, in 1920, in the Jacksonville Metropolis, uh, the newspaper of Jacksonville, the headline went, democracy in Duval County is endangered by very large registration of Negro women. Now, I'll repeat that, it was endangered by Negro women. The following line was, are the white men and white women of Duval County going to permit Negro washerwomen and cooks to wield the balance of political power? Voter repression in 1920 was very violent. Um, it is still violent today, although not as, as um, overt. What we have uh, in the in 65, we had the Voting Rights Act passed. 
And that was in response to the civil rights movement. Daisy Bates, who spoke at the uh, 1963 March on Washington, was very clear that this was about voting rights. We will sit on and we will kneel in and we will lie in if necessary until every Negro in America can vote. And that was a founding statement by an African-American woman who insisted on the right to vote. When the 65 Voting Rights was, at, was passed, that year in America's Georgia, four African-American women were arrested for trying to vote. This is after the 65 Civil Rights Act when it was against the law. However, these African-American women were standing in the line where white women were supposed to stand and they were arrested. Now they were let go, however, they could not vote still. Voting needs to be as easy and as convenient as possible. In the United States, there are more and more measures that prevent voting. In 2013, as Heather mentioned, the Civil Rights Act was effectively gutted. What happened was the enforcement of the Civil Rights Act was removed. Now you can still have the law, but without, without enforcement, it does not count. The enforcement was removed by the Supreme Court who said it was no longer needed. It is still needed and perhaps more so than ever before. 36 states have identification requirements at the polls. Seven states have strict photo ID laws, which means you have to have it from the state, such as a driver's license. Voter ID laws have been estimated to reduce voter turnout by three to two to three percentage vote, um, points, which is tens of thousands of voters. Over 21 million US citizens do not have a government issued photo identification. They are not accessible to everybody. The ID can be costly and even when they're free, there are uh, costs to obtaining documents as well as costs to going to wherever the um, document can be obtained. There is also voter registration restrictions. In Florida, we have 29 days between when you register and when you vote. 29 is one of the longest in the United States. It's up there with New York. And this is a very obvious ploy to prevent people from voting. If you forget to register, you can't vote. Many states have on-site voter registration. All countries outside the United States have on-site registration. In Kansas, they require proof of citizenship. Now, although the ACLU sued and defeated the law, it still prevented many from voting. Voter purges are another way that voting is restricted. Voter purges means that people are removed from the rolls. Now, the intent of voter purges was to remove people who had died, which makes sense. But what happens is largely African American and Hispanic communities are removed. In Hartford, Connecticut, uh, the whole town of Western Hartford, which is African American, was removed from the voter rolls by a computer algorithm that was supposedly color free. Felony disenfranchisement. In Florida, two thirds of Floridians voted to have returning citizens who had done their time vote. Nonviolent criminals done their time, paid their debt to society. However, the Supreme Court, in, well, the federal courts, the federal appeals court, not the, the Florida Supreme Court and the federal appeals court have held that in order to vote, they must pay fines. So this is an institution of poll tax, which has been declared unconstitutional, although it has certainly been applied to um, felons or returning citizens and these are largely because of the systemic racism in our country, largely African-American and Hispanic men. 
So we have voter repression. We also have calls from the uh, United States president to have sheriffs polling, um, patrolling the voting places. This is reminiscent of 1920 when the sheriffs, who were also the Ku Klux Klan, posted themselves outside the voting polls and in fact were the ones who beat Moe's Norman when he went to vote. We need to fight the voter repression. We need to vote. We need to fight it when it is even institutionalized in ourselves. When we say to ourselves or we say to others, our vote doesn't matter. Perhaps the most powerful voter suppression there is, is when we believe our vote doesn't matter. And I would say to you that we need to not only educate ourselves about voting, educate ourselves about changing voter registration laws and argue for the passage of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, but also to pay the fines of the returning citizens who desperately need to vote this election. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you so much, Dr. Armstead. And I feel that um, you actually had a message at the end. Sorry, my dog is having a moment. It's not, it sounded like you had um, a message at the end that answered a question in the chat. Liana McGowan asked, what message would you give to young people voting for the first time? And while both of you, Dr. Edwards and Dr. Armstead, were both sharing or answering the question, it became apparent that I, I couldn't help but make the connections to what happened in the past potentially happening now. Like I kept I kept seeing themes come up with what's happening now. So are there any other messages, messages that you might have for young people um, or anyone really that's voting at this time? And what correlations do you also see between what, ha what happened 100 years ago and what's happening now? What I'd like to say, what I, the message is that voting is not a privilege, as the president has said, but it is a right and we need to demand our rights. Um, in the same way, the president has also said that anti-racist teaching is un-American. Um, we need to stand up and we need to stand up as a group and insist that voting is our right and that we have to do it and that we need to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act the House has passed it. The Senate will not even take it up. And I would urge people to write their senators to take this up and to pass this law um, so that we have the Voting Rights Act of 65 restored so that people can vote without repression and also to contribute to the fines of those with nonviolent felonies. This needs to be um, as, as Crystal mark, remarked, this needs to be very uh, clear that we need to do this um, so that they can vote as well. Um, I would offer that, um, to me it feels like there's, um, this flashback is not the word, it's like a reversal. Um, everything that I'm, reading now everything that I hear from that White House, everything that I see or remember from history. Because um, I was in elementary school when the March on Washington happened. So everything that I remember from speeches and talks and activities to gain the right to vote, everything is under fire. Everything is being attacked. Um, you know, and one thought was, you know, if we don't know our history, we're doomed to repeat it. Well, that is the fact. But I think something shifted and we weren't paying attention um, that allowed these things to kind of creep in. And now they have built up where they have momentum. I am reading Cast, um, The Origins of Our Discontent by Isabel Wilkerson. And the research that she has done on our country and how things are laid out in our country and how a lot of it is repetitive, but we were a model 
for Germany when they were looking at how to get rid of the Jewish people. They looked at how the United States handled their, what they call their subversive communities. And so um, I say that to say that I think we need to, we need to pay attention. We need to engage where we can engage. Um, I agree with Dr. Armstead, write our, our senators, because when they get communication from the citizens, that gives them a clear indication of what the citizens really wants. Uh, it's no guarantee that our senators will listen, but you still have to write, we still have to act, we still have to take that step forward and do something about it. Um, and for me, I just, I just hold on to hope. Don't ask me how, I just do. Um, it, is, it is how I get through each day with every bit of crazy that I see coming at us through social media and TV screens and the information that comes at us. Um, I, I wish I could be a little more hopeful. I think Dr. Armstead was a lot more eloquent with this. I, I literally um, sit at the point of frustration every day. And so um, I donate to the, the felons campaign to make sure that their fines get paid off. I know that um, we've had two significant folks make donations. LeBron James was one. And then uh, Michael Bloomberg recent was the most recent one made contributions to that movement to make sure that uh, felons who have been, who we voted as a state, we voted overwhelmingly that we wanted these individuals to have the right to vote. And, you know, the state legislature appealed and, and here we are. So um, I think engage with your politics and your community, wherever, whatever level that is you can engage in and be, make yourself as aware as possible of what's going on and tune in um, to what's happening. Don't just check out because every vote matters. Every vote is critical. Every vote is important. I want to say thank you so much for those final messages from Dr. Armstead and Dr. Edwards. And uh, you were a mirror for me when you said <laughs> It's hard to find hope. And um, I couldn't help but find some while the both of you were talking because this can be hard, but at the same time, I feel entirely motivated because it reminds me that America, it, it reinforces or helps me um, remember to frame America is the people. We are America. And it's not this thing that's beyond us represented by politician or wealthy people. We are, we are what who make up this country. And it, you, you've given me hope and, and more motivation and empowerment to enact my right to vote. And so I hope everyone has that message from our experts tonight, that we use our right this year as an election year um, to vote and that we are motivated to uh, be knowledgeable about our politics and our candidates and just be a part of the process. So thank you so much tonight for, for the both of you uh, for being here with us. Thank you, Dr. Armstrad and, um, and Dr. Edwards. And now's time for us to think about, you know, ourselves in terms of, you know, what are we learning? So we, we, we're going to talk about this. I used to think, and now I think, and allow this to move toward some kind of action because we're gonna go into a, back into our small groups now and talk about this. And Kat, thank you so much for helping us tonight with the chat. Kat is putting these, uh, these sentences in, in the um, chat for us. I used to think, and I now think. And again, allow this to move you toward what are we going to do? Because of course, we also want to be committed to action. So we're gonna go back out into our small groups again. Uh, we'll have about eight minutes out there to share. I used to think, and now I think. We'll see you back. Welcome back, everybody. Oh, there they are, there they are. All right, welcome back, everybody. I just wonder how your groups were, and I wanted to 
give people a chance if you feel compelled to share um, your learning, you know, what is the learning? And even how does that tie to an action statement or action or commitment that you might make? Like, what are you being moved to do um, given your learning? Does anybody want to share with us or you could write it in the chat? Um, what, what is it you're learning and what is it compelling you to do or commit to? Go ahead. You can unmute yourself and share with us. Um, I would like to say some, I'm sorry, I came into the whole meeting late, so I might be a little off on what we're doing, but um, as we said in our smaller groups, I just realized, I thought I was an activist in the 60s and I realized I thought things were going well. And what I realize now is they just went underground, kind of. And they've resurfaced this over the last three and a half years. But um, what I've decided to do is just educate myself as much as I can about our real history and the real problems. And there, like someone mentioned the book cast and um, uh, of course I, I bring Kendi's book. There's so many good books out there now. I, I'm in the middle of reading Stacy uh, Stacy Abrams' book about voting in well all over, but voting in Georgia. And I guess I didn't really. I kind of knew stuff, but I didn't really. And so I feel like it's my job now to learn as much as I can about the situation the reality of where we are with this country and then decide what I can do about it. Right now, what I decided I could do about it is work really hard in this election, but it, it can't be just then. I, I, I don't know what my next role is, but I think we all need to re-educate ourselves to the real situation that our country's in. And maybe people are uh, better have been better at that than I have, but I, I'm kind of disappointed in myself. Sharon, thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? You can also write in the chat. Sharon's making a commitment to educate herself, to read and really learn their true history. Anybody else want to share? I yeah, Crystal. Share. Um, first, I want to just say thank you, Sharon, for sharing that and how honest you were. Um, I just feel compelled to share how I'm still kind of feeling the effects of my group. We were crying in it and very overwhelmed and a lot of pain was shared. And, um, we were talking about how we don't want to give up hope, but we feel very hopeless right now. And yes. I'm an activist as well, Sharon. And I think I've always had a fire in me to keep going and to keep fighting. And lately I feel it burning out. And I, I we were just sharing how we want to keep that hope, but it's been really hard. Well, I think I, I'm, I'll try to not say too much more but I appreciate those and I feel the same way some days in the last month I could barely get out of bed in the morning and I've had all the white privilege I've had privileges so it's not about me it's just about what I want our country and people what I want this to be and I'm like you I've some days I lose so much hope that I can barely deal with it. But this group has been, I've only been on 20 minutes, but just things like this make give me hope that there are so many people that feel the way I do and want to figure out a way to make it better. I, I want to, um, David, I think you were going to speak. I see you. Yes, yeah, Sharon, I'm glad to see you here. I've been, um, I was in the Air Force in 1969 to 72, so I'm surprised our paths haven't crossed. 
But um, <laughs> as I was explaining to the group, I mean, the voting age back then was 21. They reduced it to 19, 18, rather, because guys are dying out there in yeah. Southeast Asia. And to see us kind of not really go anywhere in the last 50 years, it's making me think, I'm trying to cross your mind too, at the same time, just what kind of world are we leaving to the rest of this crowd here, these students? You know, right. I mean, that, that's, that's, yeah, I have to have that, the same feeling. This is, you know, you want to say check, please, but that's not the right, right expression, of course. I mean, it, it was a fight. It was a fight um, for civil rights. The ADA fight, I'm in a wheelchair, is still ongoing. It's been a sawtooth action over the last, what, 20, 30 years. So that's still going on. And it, it's, when you, when you talk to, when you walk, look at the other medians overseas, like the BBC and DW, DW is, is uh, Germany, Berlin, and we see what's going on over there and how, what kind of reputation we have. This, is, this, this country's got to change. It's got to, and the only way we can really do it is to do it peacefully like, like Dr. Martin Luther King did and Mahatma Gandhi did. Do it peacefully, quietly, in a, in a respectful way, saying, hey, we're going to vote, and we're going to vote the way we, 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 we think is right. And as for all the stuff that's on the media, I mean, even, even, so, even the social media is going crazy. I mean, it's saying, no, we're going to find out the truth. You got to do your homework. Great. Like, like I said, my, my dad's generation, they fought and died in Europe and in uh, the Pacific. I lost a second cousin in um, World War II. He died three weeks before the war ended. I go, oh, wow. And like I said, the 58,000 guys died in Vietnam. And they talk about the Antifa. I hate to say this, but 75 million people perished in World War II. Do the numbers. We can't say they died for nothing. And we have to study the history and say, well, how did, how, did, how, did, how did it get that way? And the shocking thing about it, Sharon, and bear with me, we're seeing it come back. What was 75 years ago? And it's scary. I mean, it, it, it's to the point that, well, you have to like um, an expression that um, Clint Eastwood said, you have to get mad dog mad about it. It's okay to get mad at a concept, but not at a person. Said, hey, let, let's change this for the future generations. Do you for, think our, for our it, children, et cetera. Yes, and I, so I want to know that there's so much emotion and I think that the emotion and the pain and the suffering is real and it's valid and it's because of what we're all experiencing. And I do, I do just want us to take a collective breath with one another and know that I believe in the end, it is one another. You, me, us, that is the hope. Um, let's, let's just, if you, you can close your eyes or keep them open, but in this prayer, in this breath, it can be a prayer. If you believe in prayer, it, however you want to hold this moment, just take a deep breath in. And release. Feel each other's energy. Take a deep breath in. And release. Feel that we are here together. Take a deep breath in. and release. This is a time 
when self-care is so needed. We are experiencing collective trauma from COVID, from the racial terror, the social injustice. It is real and it's impacting all of us. I think coming together in a space like this where we can look at each other, are you looking at each other? I have found that to be very healing. When I look at you and when I know you took two hours tonight to be here with me, with us, because we care, we're invested in each other and in our country. And we're willing to learn and grow and engage for the betterment of our democracy. And I know it's eight o'clock, but I do, I do want to be able to just show you all that you're part of something that is happening and that there has been progress. And, and I, and, and this, I do not in any way, in any shape or form, want to negate what we are feeling at this moment because of what's happening right now in history today. And I want you to know with the Ocoee massacre and the history we've been talking about tonight, there's an exhibit opening up at the History Museum this weekend, and it runs for the next couple months looking at this history. This is a history Central Florida would not touch a decade ago. We are now talking about it. We have collected soil from the site of these lynchings. We have put up a marker. We have elected black officials in a COE after almost a hundred years of no black officials being elected. We have elected black officials. There has been legislation to compensate Uh, for the uh, descendants of the Ocoee massacre reparations. That bill has gone through the Florida legislature. It has not passed, but the conversation is there. We have an Alliance for Truth and Justice. We adopted a, a, a curriculum, a bill to teach this in our schools. We are having a memorial, a centennial memorial of the Ocoee massacre in Ocoee the week of November 1 through 5th. A marker is being placed in the city of Ocoee. Um, The Holocaust Center is having an exhibit coming up, looking at these injustices that we all face. The Riches Project at UCF, there's going to be an art exhibit at UCF. The Black Lives Matter movement, the call for police reform, the actions being taken in the city of Orlando at Valencia School of Public Safety to reassess the curriculum for how we teach police. These are actions. And of course, the passage of Amendment 4. And we want to encourage you that one action you could take is giving a donation to We Got the Vote, where they are collecting um, the resources to help pay uh, the fines for the returning citizens. And this is the website um, where you can make a gift. Um, So as we wrap things up tonight, I want to, I do want to give a space. I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank all the people who came tonight to help out in the small groups. Thank you to our volunteers, um, to Kat for helping with tech and for um, our presenters, Dr. Armstead, Dr. Edwards. But I do want to give just another chance if anybody would like to speak into this moment here. And if you have to leave, we understand. And yet I feel like the moment is a little bit too tender to say goodbye quite yet. Would anyone like to speak into this moment? I did find it interesting because um, usually I'm the one that needs a lot of help being hopeful most nights. And in my small group, for some reason, I just, I don't know, I just feel really, really pumped up to do some work and to get some things going. And so um, I wanna give the gift that I usually receive in these sessions where I need a little bit of an encouragement. I wanna, I don't know, just 
pour some hope into this space because I feel it tonight and I just want to give back what I've been able to get usually through this process um, that it is hard. It is hard. And everybody that spoke, um, you were, you were mirrors for me. Um, I could completely relate. And Rachel used the word collective trauma. Um, and that resonated with me and that's accurate, but I don't know. I just feel really hopeful, hopeful tonight. And so I hope that I can just spread that with you all right now as well. Thank you, Jennifer. And I think that's the power of being in community because the nights when I'm down and you're up, you got me. And then there are other moments where I got you and we have each other. And so this is, this is part of the resilience and taking care of ourselves is making sure we're connected and working together. I just want to say that there is an assessment in the chat and we really want you to click on it and give us some feedback. It's a Qualtrics, it's super short, and yet it is an opportunity for you to talk to us about your experience tonight. Who else wants to speak into this space? Thank you, Jennifer. Well, I want to share um, that in my group, it was, it was about hope. Uh, and for one thing, we had someone talking about their long years of history and being rooted in this work and how sometimes it feels that it was all in vain, which a couple of our activists shared tonight. And yet they feel some sort of hope to keep showing up. And we also had in our group a voter who just, this is their first year being able to vote, is celebrating a birthday. And, and yet, young people are showing up. And, and that to me is hope, is that we are here ignoring the siren call of Netflix. And we are here looking at each other and we are being vulnerable. So I just really felt that in my group today, that it might not look the way that it should, but that we're still showing up. Thank you, Liana. So I want to offer one last piece because um, I kept thinking about the word hope. Um, when we left the last group, came into the small group and came back. And what I remember is, what I've reconnected to is that I always have to think about, you know, my, my grandparents. Um, I think about John Lewis. I think about Francis Mary, Francis Mary Ellen, Francis Harper. I think about the people who did this under worse circumstances than I'm dealing with. Um, and just have to hold on to the fact that if they could do this, if they could keep putting one foot in front of the other, so can I. And so that's what I offer you. Think back to whoever those folks are in your ancestry, in your lineage, in your, your social history, your cultural history, wherever those folks are, they dealt with way worse than what we're dealing with now. And they still moved forward. So I would encourage us to just move forward. Ruth, thank you so much. And you know, when you're talking, I'm looking at the students that are here tonight. And I want to make a shout out to you students. I'm having a thought. You know, there's not lots of you here. And, 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 and I'm sort of relating to some of you because I think, I mean, I'm remembering when I was in college and I would show up to these cool things that had community members, you know, like grownups. I mean, I didn't quite feel like I was there yet, right? And I'd be like, wow, because it was a window into another world, like a world that I was moving into that I could make a difference in. And so I just, I don't know, I'm feeling something about you all being here, you students, because we, each one of us can affect and impact big change. And, and I just have a feeling you all are going to do that because you're here. You're hearing this. You're hearing from people who've had these life experiences and 
you've got a new, you know, knowledge is power. So thank you for joining us tonight and, and helping us, helping us lead the way. We need you. Anybody else before we wrap it up? Anybody? I don't, I'm not trying to rush anybody. I mean, I'm feeling very honored to be with you. At one point, I'm glad there's just more than one, one uh, of my generation here. Sharon, I'm so glad to see you're here. Uh, keeps me balanced. But it's to educate the next generation is absolutely great. I feel honored to be doing that. And as for the next generation to so, question everything. Inquire about everything. As my late dad says, God gave you a mind, use it. Thank you. Just don't, just don't, let, just don't let the, accept it as everything at face value. That's right. And these young people have so much to teach us too, you know, in the world we're living in. And um, so we're, we're so lucky to have each other in this kind of cross-generational experience. Is there anything else, anybody? We're going to say good night and we will stay online for people who just need to kind of debrief and just unwind a little bit. So I'll be here and probably Heather and Jennifer, but Thank you again. I hope you, did y'all go to that link and, and fill out that little form? Did you do it? You see it in the chat? It'll take you all of two minutes. But if you write a sentence and tell us what this was like for you, it's helpful. It's, it's something that keeps us going too when we get to hear back from you. All right, you can put your last thoughts in the chat if you want to say goodbye, if you want to say thank you. If you want to unmute and say goodbye to one another, Mark put something in the chat about an event happening tomorrow about more about voting. Mark, did you want to say something about it before we log off? Yeah, just very briefly, everybody. But the activist side of me thought this is a great next step from what we're doing right now. Uh, there's a town hall tomorrow uh, with some uh, judges uh, and with a current Florida um, House of Representative member, uh, who was actually one of the people who voted for these uh, new restrictions on voting. Um, they will be at this town hall answering questions. This is through the African Heritage Committee at Valencia. Um, I put the link with some more information. I'm not exactly sure how you get access to the actual session, but it's one o'clock tomorrow. And I think it would be a great time to ask, especially this representative, what he was thinking when he voted for these new uh, restrictions on voting after we had voted to allow people who had served their time to vote again. Um, in, any, in any case, I just wanted to make a mention. It's in the chat section. If anybody wants to look, it's scroll up a little bit. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Mark. Mark, for that. And um, look, y'all, everybody, look, if you're at Valencia, you could look at the calendar. Look on the Valencia calendar and it should be there. Uh, and Crystal's posting it there. Okay. I have a question for Mark, real fast. Um, am I allowed to share that link that you shared for tomorrow with my students? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, who are your, your students are Valencia students? Yes. Carla? Yeah. 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 I'll share it with everybody. Uh, we got this. I got this through my dean. So I'm not sure who else got it and how you got it. But our dean just forwarded it to me. To me. Well, um, I guess I just want to say a final thank you. Um, 22, 21 people are still here after eight. And that is a testament to commitment. Um, and I just want to say thank you for being here the entire time. Thank you for participating. And for those that had to leave a little early, we totally understand. And if you know anybody that left early, let them know that we say thank you too. So um, yeah, let's keep the work moving and going and have a great night. 
We appreciate you being here with us. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.